there's supposed to be a blizzard, so hopefully I can go book shopping. Addicted to eating cat food? Is there a reason? I like the narrator being wink wink nudge nudge. How in the world did I get here? But more importantly, how in the world do I get back? So tiny. Look at this tiny little book. Hey guys, welcome back to our channel. If you're new here, hi, my name is Angela, and today is the start of a brand new reading vlog. I am in the middle of Chilean Poet by Alejandra Zambra. I picked up this book from Portsmouth, a cozy waterside town on the border of New Hampshire and Maine. I visited 11 months ago. I can't believe it's almost been a year. Portsmouth is a compact city. It's less than 17 square miles, but packed with Georgian style clapboard residences, red brick shops, a few of which reference Charles Dickens, and lots of cozy bookstores. If I find the footage, I'll rewind to a snapshot of my first trip there, which was just a marathon of coffee, books, and work. Hey guys, welcome back. Today, I am in New Hampshire. This is my first time visiting. I'm really excited to visit all of the bookshops in Portsmouth, which is this really cute, quaint sort of, it's got a little bit of small town feel, all of the New England vibes with the red brick and the tall trees, and it's super cold outside today. There's supposed to be a blizzard, so hopefully I can go book shopping before the winter weather comes in. I bought Chilean Poet from Sheaf Street Books, which is a wonderfully chaotic, overwhelming bookshop bursting with translated fiction, obscure poetry, lit fic pics, and local favorites. This book randomly slipped off a shelf and hit the floor. I heard a thud, looked down, and saw a cover with the author line that said Alejandro Sambra, so I took it home. Sambra is the author of Multiple Choice, a little volume of poetry I read several years ago that I absolutely loved. Multiple Choice is formatted in the style of the verbal portion of the Chilean aptitude test, a standardized exam that is no longer run, but much like the SAT, was once the bane of many a Chilean student's existence. Sambra's poetry collection is said to be gimmicky, and it is, that is a very valid point, but I found the interactivity engaging. I loved being guided through multiple meanings of a poem in the sentence order portion of the poetry collection and feeling my shoulder sag during the sentence elimination section. To me, his poetry is cheeky. I'm only in the middle of part two of Chilean Poet, but I'm seeing that same cheekiness in this novel. Chilean Poet is about a stepfamily. It's about navigating a relationship with the Spanish language when the words for stepfather and stepmother have a pejorative suffix. In part one, Gonzalo and Carla are teenage lovers. They love and they lust our at an age where they believe in forevers but keep falling apart. They don't know how to navigate desire, the book in a very early portion. Let's see if I can find it. In Gonzalo's defense, it must be said that information was scarce in those wretched years, with no help from parents or advice from teachers or guidance counselors, and without any assistance from governmental campaigns or anything like that, because the country was too worried about keeping the recently recovered and still shaky democracy afloat to think about such sophisticated first world issues as an integrated policy on sex education. Suddenly freed from the dictatorship of their childhoods, Chilean teenagers were living through their own parallel transitions into adulthood. 
smoking, and listening to Silvia Rodriguez or Los Tres or Nirvana while they deciphered or tried to decipher all kinds of fears, frustrations, traumas, and problems, almost always through the dangerous method of trial and error. Carla and Gonzalez's story is trials and errors. It is earnestness overshadowed by desire-driven mistakes. They break up, of course, and nine years later, a second chance encounter begins with a hookup that turns into more hookups and ends in a pattern that starts to feel familial. When Carla and Gonzalo meet at this new stage of their life, Carla already has a son, Vicente, who is six years old. Her son is addicted to eating cat food. The way Vicente's cat food obsession is introduced made me chuckle. It's treated with the normalcy of a small child sucking their thumb. I'm still not sure what the symbolism of Vicente eating cat food is. Why does he like eating cat food? Is there a reason? Is it supposed to be funny? I'm not sure. I'm confused. I think Vicente's cat has to play a bigger part in the story because there's a cat on the cover and the way Vicente's cat, the cat's name is Darkness, is described is exactly like the cover image. So the cat does make two, well, three more major appearances in the book. It's explained in a scene close to the end, and this book overall made more sense as I inched towards the conclusion, but I didn't love Chilean Poet. This book wasn't for me, and I'm still trying to process why, because there was a lot that I enjoyed. The translation is amazing. I got the audiobook in Spanish too, so I could listen to Alejandro Asambra narrate. My Spanish is terrible. I need the English version like subtitles and reading the physical text alongside listening to the audiobook gave me so much appreciation for how smart Megan McDowell is as a translator. She captures the humor of this novel. Chilean Poet is truly a comedy of errors and this very dry, sarcastic, jocular style can be really hard to translate but it feels fun and accessible and within reach true McDowell's translation. I did feel like the syncopation was lost. I don't think English as a language that is stress-timed really has the ability to express Spanish's syllable-timed induced rhythms. I usually don't mind when this aspect of a translated book is missing, but Chilean poet is written by a well-loved poet, and the musicality with which a poet approaches writing any book, whether that is Elizabeth Acevedo writing with the fire and high or Fatima Ascar writing when we were sisters, is not lost in narrative form, the quirks and deliberation of poeticism finds its way into long-form text, especially when that text centers around Chilean poetry. So I wish I understood more than just 10 words of Spanish so I could absorb this story through the audiobook, and Alejandro Sambra himself is the omniscient narrator of Chilean poet. He provides his own thoughts and commentaries on scenes. Chilean poet feels very conversational, like someone is sitting down and telling you the story of Carla, Gonzalo, and Vicente, and later Prue, a gringa who comes to Chile and tries to dissect the landscape of Chilean poets. I like the narrator being wink wink nudge nudge. It created a distance between the narrator and the story, which in my opinion was when this book shined brightest. And it also made Chilean poet seem more self-aware that it is exploring masculinity in multiple forms, but also those forms, no matter how many shapes they took on, are a very limited heterosexual view of masculinity. Chilean poet has scenes where it tries to be more inclusive of other people's identities, but the way it does so is by othering. And I guess that's my problem with this book. The way bisexual women are written in Chilean poet feels like a creepy straight man's fantasy, but it's also satirizing the way some men think and what they expect, but not every scene is satirical. So sometimes reading Chilean Poet just made me uncomfortable because I wasn't sure in moments. I feel like I need to reread this book at some point because maybe if I sit with it and annotate it and break up the humor, I won't be in this muddle of feelings. Usually when I don't like a book, I like to research it or listen to a talk with the author so I can understand their intentions, where they are coming from when crafting a story. So I might try that with this book. Beyond that, characters who weren't the center of the story felt very two-dimensional. I felt like certain pieces of the novel dragged on too long, like 
the happy family montage, I won't spoil anything that's not in the blurb, but elaborating on those kind of moments created a thick and middle, but also stretching the story like Taffy made me personally feel the absence of Gonzalo's perspective, especially when Chilean poets started following other characters. And feeling Gonzalo's absence for so long is why I loved the ending of Chilean Poet. The last few chapters were sweet and wistful. I have a lot of mixed emotions regarding this book, so I don't know if I'm gonna start any new books today. I got How to Say Babylon from the library and I might start that, but I'm also in the final stages of a website update and I can finally see the light at the end of the tunnel, so I might work on trying to hit that milestone before the middle of next month, which is my actual deadline. And if I end up working and not reading anything new, I'll just share a Portsmouth book haul tomorrow. These are all the books that I bought in Portsmouth. I picked up Dark Matter by Blake Crouch and Ninth House by Leigh Bardugo from a River Run bookstore. That bookstore has an arch of books leading to a second room and typewriters for sale. It's got a really nice fantasy and sci-fi collection. I read Dark Matter by Blake Crouch a few months earlier, and this was the book that got me into science fiction. It was not my introduction to sci-fi, but it was a beginner sci-fi book that made me want to read more science fiction. Dark Matter is fast-paced. It kept me up. Jason is a physics lecturer at a local university. His life isn't exactly what it could have been. I mean, there are aspects of his life that he wouldn't give up for anything, a wife he adores, and a kid he loves, but Jason kind of wonders if he could have been something more. This is a feeling that's heightened when he goes to congratulate his friend Ryan on winning a research award. One day he wakes up to a life that isn't the one he's been living and he's wondering how in the world did I get here but more importantly how in the world do I get back? This book was an absolute roller coaster ride. It got crazy. It got intense. Blake Crouch's writing is a list of short snappy sentences. This was a very tell don't show book. A lot of the twists felt predictable. The characters were absolutely not fleshed out which irritated me to no end because the directions that this story took felt like it could have allowed for more character depth. I still don't know much about Jason's wife, except she's a talented artist, she has a few regrets in life, and she has sexy Spanish eyes. I wanted more skeletons in the closet unearthed for both Jason and Daniela and even Ryan, and I didn't get that, but what I read was a book that was still utterly compelling, that seemed to hypnotize my hands and eyes and made me want to continue reading very quickly. I wanted to add this to my collection because, of course, this was the book that started my sci-fi phase. Ninth House is the first book in an adult fantasy series that follows Alex Stern as she navigates ghosts and Yale secret societies. I haven't finished reading Ninth House yet. I've I've started this book many times, almost every fall since Ninth House was released, with the exception of last year. I have borrowed this book from my local library. I get a fourth of the way through it, sometimes halfway through it, before I have to return my copy and then fall slips away. And when I pick up Ninth House the next year, I have completely forgotten what this book is about. I also picked up a mini Shakespeare book from a shop called Pickwick's, which is a gift shop that has a no filming and photography policy, but they have bookish merchandise and perfumes and candles. So anything from lotions to Paddington Bear stuffed toys is at this store. And I got this little tiny novelty copy of Shakespeare. This book is the size of my index finger. It is so small and there's readable text in it. Pull it out for y'all. Yeah, this book is so tiny. Look, look, look at this tiny little book. Like, <laughs> it, it has a little bookmark in it, and there is, there is text. I don't know if y'all can see the text, but there is Shakespearean. They're, they're not the full sonnets, but they are quotes from sonnets that you can see. So there's quotes from Sonnet seventy nine, and then Romeo and Juliet. So it's just different romantic quotes from Shakespeare in this 
little tiny book that looks like it's the size of candy. Before I end this reading vlog, thank you so much for watching. I want to show you one more bookshop that I visited in Portsmouth. This was a wonderful recommendation from a grocer at Sanders Fish Market. He said that this bookshop was his favorite in Portsmouth. Unlike most bookstores in Portsmouth, Book and Bar is big. It's a sweeping space. Bookshelves fence, a cafe style seating area, and a big liquor backed bar counter. Some of Book and Bar's bookcases are linked together, others are tucked behind tables. On busy days, it's a bit awkward to navigate. Luckily, fiction resides in its own aisle, as does world history. Portsmouth Book and Bar's motto is eat, drink, read, repeat. It's a place that feels casual, a place where you can grab a bite and relax with a book in hand.